summer long, and uh, we hope you enjoy your time with us today. So the Penn Sustainability Office is honored to host two applied student learning programs each summer, uh, the Civic Sustainability Fellows and the Integrating Sustainability Across the Curriculum Program. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Natalie Walker for supporting ISAC and Elizabeth Maine for her support on the Civic Sustainability Fellows Program. I would also like to thank Ann Papa George for her continued support for applied learning at Penn. And certainly not least, I share my deep thanks for the faculty and the community sponsors who have worked with us throughout this very unusual summer. Today, I'm gonna to give a brief background on both programs and then we will hear report outs from our students. First, a little bit about the Civic Sustainability Fellows Program. Uh, the Plans Climate Sustainability Action Plan 3.0 has an explicit goal to support the city's regional sustainability objectives and to provide professional development and real world training uh, learning opportunities for Penn students. Penn Civic Sustainability Fellows Program addresses this goal by placing undergraduate and graduate student interns in summer jobs with city agencies and nonprofit organizations focused on sustainability and social equity. In addition to the CSAP 3.0 goal, the Civic Sustainability Fellows Program aims to align to President Gutman's Penn Compact 2022 by providing the opportunity for Penn students, staff and partners uh, to be innovative, to be radically inclusive and to positively impact our local community. These internships focus on specific issues that have a tie back to the Penn community. This year, we have three Civic Sustainability Fellows working with the City of Philadelphia's Office of Sustainability, Philadelphia Energy Authority, and UC Green. Integrating Sustainability Across the Curriculum, or ISAC for short, was established to help Penn faculty introduce environmental sustainability into existing and new courses. The Penn Sustainability Office provides full funding, to support, full funding support for graduate or undergraduate uh, summer research assistants who work directly with faculty to update and or create new syllabi, lecture, lectures, assignments, tests, and or tests that incorporate environmental themes. Each student works with two different professors starting in June to allow the students to benefit from exposure to two different faculty members working on two different courses. This year, we had six students working with 10 faculty. And now moving us to the student presentations, we will have a sponsor of each student give a short introduction and then turn it over to the student who will share a summary of their work over the summer. To kick us off, I'm happy to introduce Sarah Light, who's an Associate Professor of Legal Studies and Business Ethics at Wharton. Uh, Sarah, feel free to take it from here. Great, Nina, thank you so much. I will be very brief. I was delighted to have the opportunity to work with Hanam Yoon this um, summer. Hanam was my student last fall in Legal Studies 215, Environmental Management Law and Policy, and was an outstanding student. So I was so delighted when she applied. Um, I, uh, she is a candidate for a Bachelor of Arts from the College of Arts and Sciences with a double major in environmental science and political science, and she is a junior. Um, uh, she worked with me on two classes, both of which are in the planning and design stage. One is on climate and environmental leadership, and that is a new class that will involve a leadership expedition run by the McNulty Leadership Program over spring break, as well as coursework. Um, and the other is a uh, class that I'm hoping to organize uh, at some point in the future um, that would draw upon uh, um, faculty from many different departments on business, climate, and the environment. So take it away, Hanam. Hopefully that was brief enough. Thank you, Professor Light. Um, as she mentioned, I took environmental management law and policy with her. It's LGSP 215. I strongly recommend it to any of the students here. Um, anyway, these are the two courses that I um, helped with under the ISAC program. Um, and they are to be taught in Wharton in the coming fall and spring. Um, Professor Light will know that I formatted these slides in a very similar fashion to the slides of some of the course modules. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, you might have to keep pressing the arrow buttons. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one course I worked on was a comprehensive uh, introduction to the intersection between business and climate change. Um, and the other was uh, about climate leadership, which has a climate expedition trip during spring break built into it. Um, the climate leadership, of course, aims to pretty much interrogate how to encourage 
um, improve and leverage leadership by individuals, organizations, governments, and business firms uh, for a sustainable future. Um, the goal of these courses is to really boost the understanding of students who will go on to be the leaders and thinkers in various business environments. Um, we wanted students to understand what challenges lie ahead of pushing for a greener future um, and building a greener corporate culture. Um, you know, and how, how do those challenges, um, how can those challenges be overcome with the right sort of leadership and the right networks with third parties and the right employment of certain laws, policies, and various governance models. Um, we also want them to understand how and why certain firms are environmental leaders and what factors can really prop up a firm to develop into a more sustainable one. Uh, furthermore, we want students to understand how sustainability can act as an intersection between corporate bodies and government bodies. Um, what roles do both bodies play and how can they help each other to develop a genuinely sustainable society? Um, and finally, um, it's important to understand how being more sustainable has a genuine um, positive impact on society at large um, and that those positive impacts can further improve uh, financial performance and growth at large. And so uh, here are my personal goals. Um, I wanted to know how to accelerate, uh, I guess, the sustainable transition um, and understand the important laws, policies, and forms of management that can all make that happen. Um, I also wanted to know where the gaps were, what we needed, um, and to better just determine what role I can play in the future. Um, then, of course, I wanted to develop some ideas for my senior thesis that's upcoming next year um, with, uh, of course, the research skills to accompany it. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to be in the know with recent developments with climate legislation. Um, this semester, I'm going to be in D.C. working for the Office of Enforcement and Compliance Assurance at the EPA um, as a legal intern. So I, of course, want to cover as much environmental lingo and understanding as I can before I start working um, full time there. Uh, next slide, please. So these courses naturally had some overlap. Um, here are pretty much the central questions to both courses. You know, if you're on a corporate board, if you're in a business firm, why should you care about sustainability and about climate change? Um, how can you, as a leader in a business environment, incorporate environmental accountability into corporate leadership models? And finally, um, which companies are, you know, good to collaborate with for a leadership venture? Um, what are the leading companies and business models when it comes to confronting climate change? Um, next slide. So to formulate answers to these central questions, we, I guess, dove more into the specifics, which are as follows. Um, so for the first central question, do sustainable firms actually perform better financially? And if they do, why? Um, what sort of values and cultures of sustainable firms have um, what do they have that set them apart from others? And you know, what characteristics of sustainable firms and investments make them so attractive financially these days? Um, for the second central question, we dove into more about what the mandatory and voluntary disclosure models are, um, what environmental considerations are actually financially material, um, and how can corporate boards really unify and spread um, environmental education and leadership across their companies? And then for the final central question, um, you know, we had to see what kind of companies we wanted to incorporate into the course. There are small companies like Cotopaxi, um, which is a sustainable clothing brand that was founded by a Wharton graduate. You know, there are new companies like TerraCycle, which leverage and collaborate with larger companies to really spread the reality of a circular economy and um, has started, if you know it, uh, the Zero Waste Box and Loop Initiative. Um, then, of course, we looked at larger companies like Unilever and BlackRock as well. What are they doing on the national and international scale? Uh, next slide, please. So then more central to just um, the business and climate change course, uh, which is to be taught in the fall, um, there were just more questions that had to do with policy and law. Um, so we dealt with, you know, uh, extended producer responsibility, circular economy, um, and thought about what the laws and current policy developments in these areas actually are. Um, we looked into investors and asset management, uh, asset managers and how they um, deal with climate change. Um, again, what is required legally for them, who is pushing for more investor engagement and what's hot in the news. Um, and then we also dove into greenwashing and SBC green guides, um, 
what laws, what legal cases are relevant to businesses and business leaders to know. Um, evidently, the two courses naturally deal with a lot of elements of sustainability, um, particularly corporate sustainability and the relevant laws and trends that affect corporate decisions. So um, many, so, so many sustainability initiatives, whether led by investors, government, companies, or all three are out there. Um, and I think it's just sustainability in general is a very creative and growing focus in so many businesses. Um, and there were just a lot of examples that shed some optimism amongst the recent and grim uh, UN climate report, as well as the recent IEA reports. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so um, I enjoyed my time in the program a lot. Um, I have learned so much from Professor Light. So thank you, Professor Light, for helping to make the Isaac program so worthwhile and um, successful for me. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. You can feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question now, or if you be more comfortable, we can take questions at the end as well. So if you think of a question, well, you know, later on, feel free to ask that too. Oh, Hanan, I'll jump in since I don't hear a question. This is more of a comment. I love what Engine One is doing. They're trying to get people in on the corporate board to make these great decisions. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. They just had a big vote and they're trying to get ExxonMobil to be more sustainable. Yeah, so a bit of background to that. So Engine Number One, they're like a really small like hedge fund or something, um, like very, very small. They don't have much at all, yet they've been able to buy so much of Exxon shares to the point where they're really influencing their corporate leadership. And they did this huge big analysis of what Exxon is doing wrong. And it was very, um, it, it was very financial, very factual um, and very convincing from my perspective in a very objective way. So they, it's definitely a very unprecedented kind of form of governance um, and, you know, really shows the influence that investors can have. So definitely check it out and do um, a bit of research. Uh, if you're interested. Also, you can reach out to me. I can send you the research that I did as well. So. Well, if there are no more questions, then we'll move on to the next session. Again, you feel free to put questions in the chat and then we'll also hopefully have time at the end as well. Uh, so our next uh, student uh, will be introduced by her sponsors, uh, Megan Ryerson and Bill Young. Hi, uh, this is Bill Young. I teach uh, LARP uh, P760 uh, topics in ecology. Louisa is a junior at the College of uh, Arts and Sciences, majoring in environmental science. Her resume is amazing. I was looking at it like, oh my gosh, she's very talented. Her summer project was to study algal blooms for both carbon sequestration and use as biofuel. And so in two ways, she's helping to uh, save the planet. So that's really cool. And I think she found out at our little preview a couple of days ago that Roger Coons, who is a professor who helped on this, is putting her in with the X Prize for Elon Musk for um, how to do carbon sequestration and get carbon out of the atmosphere down to the levels that are sustainable. So good luck, uh, Louisa. Thanks so much, Professor Young, for the introduction. So today I'll be presenting the work that I did this summer as an Isaac intern. Next slide, please. So I worked on two different courses this summer. The first one I'm gonna talk about is planning, and the next one is topics in ecology with Professor Young. Next slide, please. So the first one I'm gonna talk about planning my numbers is taught by Dr. Megan Ryerson and her TA, Josh Davidson. So this course focuses on the importance of R for handling big data, both in general and within city regional planning and policy. 
So through this course, students learn basics of R, but more advanced skills such as data correlation, regression modeling, logic modeling, and big data analysis and mining. Next slide, please. So my work this summer for Dr. Ryerson could be split up into three parts. So the first one is finding data sets, next one learning R and preparing the lesson, and the last one conclusion and next steps. So because R is all about handling really big data sets and finding ways to manipulate and analyze the, the data, the first step was to find the data sets for students to practice with. And because this course is about urban planning and my focus on sustainability, I find free large environmental related data sets and they had to be large enough to really show off the power of R. So about like at least a couple hundred to a couple thousand rows. So to the right, I have some sources that I found these data sets with, the Chicago Transit Authority, the EPA, and a few others, as you can see. Next slide, please. So these are just some examples of some interesting data sets that I found. So the first one is ridership by bus routes within the Chicago Transit Authority. And this one had about 33,000 rows. And then the next one is air quality index by Core based statistical area, which is basically like a city. This one had a few hundred rows. And the last one, which I found very interesting was city employee earnings in 2019 in Philadelphia. And this one was really big with about 255,000 rows. And so why R, like why is R so useful? So unlike many other coding and programming languages, R is completely free and also open source. So there's thousands of packages ready to install. So this means that the capabilities of R are also always expanding and it's also especially great for graphics. So how did I learn R this summer? There's a lot of websites that are very specific to learning programming languages, which are really helpful. And then there's also an entire free textbook for R. Of course, like almost, like almost anything else, there's the internet and YouTube, which provide a lot of great in-depth explanations about R. Next slide, please. So part of my work this summer was creating a 15 minute Zoom lesson on teaching students for the course how to merge tables using R. So I took a data set um, with information about air quality index in different cities and another data set with demographics in different cities and combined them in multiple ways and just kind of talked through that with R and with different code. Next slide, please. And on my work, through work this summer, I came to two different conclusions. So the first, despite all the like free data there is online, there really weren't that many data sets about environmental justice, despite its like prevalence now and its prevalence in the future comes. And also I saw firsthand the importance of R for handling big data in general, but specifically to cities, just because there's so much information and it's really hard to make sense of it without Next slide. So the second course I worked on was Topics in Ecology, taught by Professor William Young. So this course teaches landscape architecture through ecological concepts, it focuses a lot on the reclamation of disturbed landscapes. And it also teaches some elements of green architecture and design. And to the right, I just have a picture of Sierra Green, which is a really popular green roof in Philly. And they're becoming more common now because they have a lot of great recreational and environmental purposes. Next slide. So my work for Professor Yes Summer could be split up into three parts. So land use and sustainability now, carbon sequestration via algae, and the future of carbon sequestration via algae. So to begin, I just kind of wanted to understand where like land use was at at the US currently. So I started off by reading the 2100 Project, an atlas for the Green New Deal. And this was written by Penn's own McCarg Center. 
and it was created in response to climate change, the urgency of climate change, and population growth, which is, again, increasing the urgency. And it was a really great read. I definitely recommend it for anyone who's interested in land use in any way. It had like a lot of amazing maps detailing by what amount the U.S. would have to change its land use in order to meet its climate mitigation goals. So this one to the left shows job losses and where they would most likely occur if the climate crisis is to wor worsen. And the one to the right shows natural carbon sequestration potential across the U.S. Next slide. So over the summer, I had the chance to work with Professor Young's colleague and friend, Dr. Roger Coons, and he's a teacher, author, geologist, and more. And he had an idea to take a lake devoid of life in an old quarry, insert fertilizer into the lake so that an algal bloom is created. And then this algal bloom would sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, thus lowering the, lowering the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. And this algae could be harvested and permanently removed from the atmosphere. And this process could be done again in order to continue to reduce the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. And yeah, this is part of, this is like the beginning stage of a project for Elon Musk's X Prize competition where innovators compete with new um, carbon sequestering technology. And just as a side note, you could also take that harvested algae and use it as biofuel, which would not be reducing the, it would not be taking the carbon out of the air, but it would still be a new source of renewable energy. Next slide. So during my work for the project, I created two spreadsheets. This first one up here has 417 algae species native to New York and their temperature tolerance, pH tolerance, their toxicity, their food, whether they fixate nitrogen, and this kind of just helps us determine which species of algae might be the best for this project. And the second spreadsheet down here lists the different carbon fluxes through different ecosystems. So I included greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gas removals, and then the rate of these emissions and removals in tons per acre per year. Next slide, please. So this last slide, I wanted to include the pros of algae as a biofuel because I just did a lot. I looked into it a lot this summer and I found it very fascinating. So it has no competition with food, whereas if you use a crop like corn as a biofuel, that's a very big critique because people are starving and you use energy. And it can also grow in a variety of water. So it can grow in salt water, fresh water. It has a high oil, oil yield, which makes it really great for a biofuel. It's one of the only non-renewable sources that's the adaptable based industries like jet or car. It's very CO2 tolerant and it has a very high Kelvin cycle efficiency, which terrestrial plants don't really have. Next slide. Finally, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone who worked with me this summer and helped me out. Um, thank you, Dr. Megan Ryerson, Joshua Davidson, Professor William Young, Dr. Ryan, Natalie Walker, and all of Penn Sustainability. Thank you. Oh, and if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Louisa. That was some fascinating research. And Again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself, either way works for us. I have a question, Louisa. I'm wondering um, with the algal study, um, whether you considered impacts on wildlife and how that was included in the study. Yes, definitely is an important part of like creating a huge bloom because algae especially in New York, toxic algae. So I included um, one column of the spreadsheet had the toxicity, whether it was toxic, yes or no, and also like how, how toxic exactly. And then I also included a column on like, if it's a food source for other organisms, so that would impact like its role in the ecosystem. Very interesting, thank you. Thank you, great question. Hi, may I ask a question, please? Yes, of course. Um, 
Lisa? Yeah, hi, sorry. Hi. I might, my internet might have cut out. Oh, no, it could have been me uh, too. Thank you so much for the presentation. And it was an absolute uh, delight working with you. Um, I thought it was a really sharp observation uh, that uh, for all the open data we have and we talk about that we really don't have a lot of the open data we need in terms of the environment and environmental justice. And I wonder if you could, for us, just take that one step further. And, you know, if you were making recommendations, you know, writing a memo, uh, encouraging, you know, a different organization, whether it's a local organization or a federal organization, uh, to collect some more data, in, in what direction should they go? Yeah, so I would say just a, like I'm thinking of Philadelphia like where we live in Penn like there's so many environmental injustice like just in our like block like I I'm thinking recently of like high schools that have gotten in trouble for asbestos so I would say just really like look around to what you see and I guess if no one else is gathering the data then I guess try to gather it yourself as best as you can or reach out to people in the community who might have the resources to gather the data. Thank you. That's such a important point. Thank you, Louisa, for sharing that with us. And yeah, I think this can peak a lot of our, our thinking in terms of how we can be more conscious of the environmental justice data that we can encourage here at Penn and beyond. So thank you for that. Um, so any other questions for Louisa? If not, we're going to keep moving forward. Oh, Josh, go ahead. Louisa, also want to say it was Awesome getting to work with you uh, this whole summer. Um, wanted to sort of build off of your response to Dr. Ryerson's question. What about like the tools that you used? Like how, how do you think that the tools that you learned could be used to do that sort of local data collection differently from, uh, from, from tools you hadn't used before the summer? Great question. Yeah. So over the summer, like in my process of learning R, I focused a lot on merging different data sets of data. So that is an amazing way that I would think you can really find the data you need because I'm thinking about the air quality index data set that I found. So it showed like how many days were bad in different cities, but then it doesn't, if you could combine that with the data set of maybe the poverty rates or the um, average earnings for each family, that would be a really great data, a great way to pull different data that might be connected that we previously wouldn't have seen the connection of. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, Melissa, thank you for those comments about EII's efforts to increase um, research at in, in the libraries as well. Uh, there's a lot of exciting work being done here, and I think it's a very important topic that we can keep moving forward. So thank you. So in the interest of time, we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, our next presentation, uh, thank you for getting the slides up. Teresa Jimenez is, good, is the sponsor, and she will be introducing our student. Hi, everybody. So um, Ale Alessandra Pintado and I work on the course Sustainable Development and Culture in Latin America. Uh, this course um, advocates for, the, for culture as the fourth pillar of sustainable development uh, because culture study, the study of culture as well as a resource and a constraint to sustainable development has been pretty much ignored among environmentalists and has only been recently, recently been identified as the fourth pillar of sustainable development. Among sustainability scholars, 
who consider that sustainable development is only achievable if there is harmony and alignment among the objectives of cultural diversity, social equity, environmental responsibility, and economic viability. In order to get to this, um, we, because we're placing a big emphasis on culture, we needed to um, dig in into a lot of literary text uh, written by um, indigenous peoples uh, that were, ha have never been translated, only thanks to technology have been translated to English. But other than that, we had no way of, but not in, in, in other languages. Um, so um, Alexandra, Alexandra is a um, native of, she speaks, she's a native of Spanish, she speaks Spanish at, at the native, native level, in, in, in English as well. She has a major in, she's, she, she's a major in linguistics and a minor in German. So this was a great asset for the needs that, of, of the course. And she has done an outstanding job in translating back and forth text from, from English into Spanish and vice versa, because this course has been taught in two different languages. We had a section for English speakers and one section for Spanish speakers who are, are either, they could be either native speakers of Spanish or majors and minors of Spanish. So I'm gonna let Alexandra, Alexandra talk about her work um, on this course. Thank you so much. Yes, so uh, my name is Alessandra Pintado Urbank. I'm a rising junior, as Professor Jimenez said. Um, I am studying linguistics and German, um, and my father's from Spain, so I grew up speaking Spanish, and so I'm at the, the native level. Um, next slide, please. So this course is called Sustainable Development and Culture in Latin America, and it really emphasizes the importance, as Professor Jimenez says, of culture within the realms of sustainable development, and specifically in Latin America. And so um, I believe it's also a global cinema, seminar course, which um, yep. I'm not sure it's happened the past two years because of COVID, um, but it also includes a one-week immersive experience in Costa Rica where uh, students are able to see um, the unsustainable farming practices in the cult cultivation of um, the co coffee product. Um, and we also focus just on looking at sustainable development through the three different perspectives of environmental and economic and a social and cultural um, level. And as Professor Heeman has said, it's also offered in Spanish. So I had the really cool opportunity to translate these texts from English to Spanish and from Spanish to English, just to allow students who are majors and minors or who are native speakers to um, take this you know, complex course within um, the Spanish language. Next slide. So my main um, work plan and goals for this summer uh, was obviously translating reading materials. We did focus on three main, we chose uh, fictional stories, which is um, the indigenous text that have never been translated before. Um, but we also um, worked on translating articles, texts, and um, I worked a little bit on translating um, captions for a video documentary. Um, I was also able to develop some discussion questions and homework assignments, um, again, from English. Um, in English and Spanish, and um, assembling some uh, PowerPoints for in-class presentation and for lectures. And for me, um, my main goals uh, for the summer were to just learn more about the Latin American culture and its intersection with sustainable development, um, and really dive into uh, those texts that have, um, you know, really been, been seen before in English and learn more about that culture. Next slide, please. So uh, the three main stories that we focused on um, are traditional Wichol stories. So if you didn't know, uh, the Wichol people are indigenous people um, in Mexico, and um, they speak Spanish as well as the Wichol language. So a lot of these texts were actually in Spanish, but had a lot of vocabulary in uh, the Wichol language, which I do not speak. So an interesting part of translating these texts were finding um, what these uh, you know, vocabulary words were, and then trying to translate them into Spanish and then also into English. Um, and another interesting thing uh, was that when you're translating these poetic stories that talk about the earth and about how to appreciate, you know, the crops that, uh, that these people grow, um, they're very, uh, they're 
certain nuances that are difficult to, to translate into English and certain expressions. So that's something that I really worked on this year because um, I speak Spanish, obviously, in you know the context of my family um, and sometimes in school. But um, translating, you know, these stories and, and fictional stories uh, was something that I've never done before, and was something that was really enlightening. And um, and I definitely saw my improvement in being able to translate uh, fiction throughout the throughout the summer. Um, and so the main focus of these stories, sorry, um, is as I mentioned before, really. Um, Talk, talking about the divide between the Mestizos and the Michel um, people. And so uh, the people who are still in the village and the people who have migrated over to the city and understanding the differences in how they um, you know, discuss the land and how um, they think about the earth and um, the cultivation of crops and of food. Um, and also just you know, the divide that there is between um, these um, indigenous people and you know, the more modern, I guess, uh, people who have moved into an urban lifestyle. Next slide. I was also, um, as I mentioned before, I translated um, some captions for a uh, video documentary. Um, and so this one in particular is um, the Fiesta del Tambor, which is the um, festival of the drum. And so it is an agricultural festival um, about, uh, that talk, you know, celebrates, I guess, the um, seasonal um, the seasons and the crops that um, that the villagers um, cultivate. Um, and it's kind of like a, a new cycle of, um, of, the, of the land and of the crops. And so what was interesting with this is that um, I speak, uh, as you, you know, as, as you may know, um, just like in English, everyone has their own accent and their own um, dialect. And so um, in this particular one, it really uh, worked on, um, you know, training my ears and, and focusing on little um, pronunciation of, of different words that were different to my own, you know, uh, Spanish language. And so this was um, a very fun project for me to, to um, work on learning about a different um, type of, of Spanish language, I guess. Next slide. And finally, the, um, the last main um, translation project that I worked on was um, this text by, uh, it's actually a speech by Alan Garcia Perez. He is the president of the Republic of Peru in 2011. And um, this is a, an article, uh, a speech that he um, gave um, in October of 2007. And I translated this speech over to English. And this this was interesting because, um, first of all, it's more of an academic text than the Wichel stories that I translated. Um, so again, it's a different um, format for my translation skills of translating a text with a lot of um, difficult uh, language and new vocabulary words that are um, sometimes um, you know, a little, a little difficult to translate. Um, and, but what was, what I really wanted to focus on here was trying to uh, give the students who were taking the class in English and in Spanish, the same um, kind of format and, and style of the text. So um, again, working on translating um, sentences in a very similar format and, and, you know, ensuring that it was the same, um, the same experience for both students who were taking it in the different languages. And so um, this text actually focused a little bit more on the, um, you know, what the politicians thought about um, the land and, um, you know, how how this president, you know, thought that they sh the country should use, you know, the land more to create jobs and to, to create more revenue and more money for the, uh, for the nation, um, you know, versus the other stories, which were really about appreciating the earth and, and the crops that, that they grow. Next slide. So it's, you know, the general connections to sustainability, um, of course, you know, the representation of um, culture and sustainability uh, within the Wichol stories and the, and the Wichol tradition and culture. I learned a lot about that. I, I didn't really know um, much about the Wichol culture, um, but it was very interesting to see, you know, their appreciation of um, and their categorization of the gods and of how they appreciate um, the earth in their, in their own way. And then also within the questions and the uh, PowerPoints that I developed that I didn't include in the slideshow, we also talked about um, the three different um, main um, crops, I guess, um, the peyote, the coca, and the, the coffee that um, Professor Jimenez focused on within her course about shaping you know, the modern identity of Latin America today. Um, 
and again, we hit with, within that learning about the unsustainable uh, farming practices within these products. Next slide. Uh, finally, I'd really uh, like to um, share a special note of thanks to uh, Professor Jimenez. She really, she was wonderful this summer um, in, in helping me and guiding me throughout this work. Um, it's something that I've never done before. Um, and I can say now that I, I feel pretty confident in, in translating uh, all different kinds of texts and, and styles of, of writing. Um, and I, I really appreciate ISAC for giving me this opportunity of working uh, with her this summer. So I'd love to take any questions if anyone has any or at the end. So fascinating. Thank you so much, Alessandra. It's just exciting to see how culture impacts sustainability in such a specific way. And the findings from your research is I'm sure gonna have long-term impacts. So thank you so much. We are getting kind of tight on time. So we're gonna, if people have questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat and then we'll try and get the, to them at the end um, just so we can keep things rolling. But again, thank you so much. That was very near and dear to my heart. So thank you. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to uh, our next presentation. The sponsors for this uh, student are Shelly Spector and Billy Fleming. Hi, hi folks, I'm Billy. I think I'm introducing because I, I know Shelly was having some computer issues this week, but um, I, I'll just say quickly uh, what, what a pleasure it's been to get to know and work with Sydney this summer. Um, and in addition to really wanting to thank Nina and Natalie for their leadership of ISAC, also really want to thank them for pairing me with Sydney, who was just a phenomenal um, you know, student to have on this summer with me. And so Sydney, Sydney's and C's, uh, chemistry and biomolecular engineering major, so already much smarter than I am. Um, and this summer really threw herself uh, into both some really highly technical and highly theoretical scholarship with me, um, looking at some of the ways in which the prison industrial complex and the fossil fuel industry um, sort of come together and merge in their operations in a couple of sites that I teach uh, in, a port, in a design studio here called Designing a Green New Deal. So in Appalachia and the Mississippi Delta, uh, in Appalachia, looking specifically at the abandoned mine lands program and its use as kind of a vehicle for the prison building industry in that region, and in the Mississippi Delta in the former plantations and still some current plantations and their, their role as sites of kind of conversion into the larger cultural state of the, the rural South. Um, and so with that, I will throw it to Sydney and let her tell you some more about uh, the work she did this summer. Thank you so much, Professor William, for that introduction. Um, as he said, I was working with him over the summer and I was also working with Professor Shelley Spector. Um, and so I will start off by um, the course that I was working with uh, Professor Shelley Spector, which is Arts and the Environment. Next slide, please. So this is a visual arts course taught by Professor Shelley Spector, which explores the place of art in the environment and how those ideas have evolved over time and influenced the practice of artists and the understanding of the contemporary world. Um, as it is the intersection of environmental sustainability and artistic practices, it is our hope that those who do this particular course are from a variety of different disciplines, schools and backgrounds as its relevance cuts across numerous fields. Um, so at the end of the course, the students will understand the global political and um, social impacts of artistic outputs. Next slide. So the course content could be divided up into a number of different components, some of which I have listed here. Um, so my work over summer basically included putting together and analyzing some of the art pieces and art projects, um, as well as readings that will be used in the class, a few of which I will be taking you through today. Next slide. So geoglyphs are a type of land art that consists of a large design inscribed into earth, stones, or gravel. They were mainly done in the prehistoric eras, and so there's a lot of mystery surrounding them. They have, however, provided to be um, great cultural and social significance today. Next slide. In the 18th and 19th centuries, artists would portray the enormity and turbulence of nature and how humans have responded to it in their artwork. Edmund Burke explains that fe feelings of terror, like those brought about by these paintings, are stronger in operation that, than the feelings of pleasure, hence their great impacts. Next slide. In the late 18th and 19th century, 
artists began to take notice of and document the changing environment caused by industrialization. So there were different responses by very, uh, various different artists, some of who were critical about the changing landscape and uh, some of who found beauty in the symbols of modernity. For example, this piece by um, Armand Gulliamin. Next slide. So in the 20th century, Agnes Dennis planted a two acre wheat field in lower Manhattan. The wheat was supposed to symbolize uh, mismanagement, waste, world hunger and ecological concerns and was intended to draw attention to these more pressing matters. So this field, as you can see from this picture, provided a very stark contrast against the towering buildings of Manhattan and was deliberately chosen as a landfill created where the twin towers were built. Next slide. We also looked at investigative living, where some artists rethought our way of living, such as Andrea Zittel, who developed this unit, which takes up only 60 square feet of space and provides for all the basic needs. Minimal minimalism was also a common theme in her other work. Next slide. So some artists strive to raise awareness, such as Aviva Romani, who uses her art to preserve land endangered by fossil fuel and infrastructure. So in this slide, um, she painted a blue slurry on the trees and uses the art copyright law to protect the land from pipeline developments. Next slide. This is her again. Next slide. So some curators put the indigenous at the center of American art. Many artists are using the art to represent the value of the indigenous people, as well as criticize the actions of those that displace them. Next slide. So this particular project here was in response to the installation of the Dakota Access Pipeline, which would threaten the water source of those in the Stand Standing Rock Soaks tribe. Um, so those demonstrating against the construction of this pipeline held these mirrors either overhead or in front of them to not only act as a shield, but also to show the oppressors a, a reflection of their own violent actions. Next slide. So lastly, we looked at secular economy in the art world. Um, here is a picture of John Sabro, who is an artist who collaborated with engineer Guy Riefla to turn pollution such as toxic runoff composed of iron oxide from abandoned coal mines into non-toxic paints and pigments. These pigments were released and sold by the companies and the profits went towards cleaning up polluted streams in Ohio. Next slide. Lastly, um, I will talk about how sustainability is integrated into the course. So um, this course um, not only showcases the artists, museum and galleries um, that are thinking about sustainability, but it also provides an opportunity for the students to individually and collaboratively um, use these themes to create artwork. Um, the students will be assigned to create work that is in keeping with the concerns of the impacts that we have on the environment. In the spring of 2022, a shorter version of the course will be integrated into Critical Issues in Art, which is also a course taught by Professor Shelley Spector, and a full-on studio class will be proposed for the fall of 2022. Next slide. So I will present my next course, which I worked together with on with uh, Professor William Fleming. Next slide. So what is the Green New Deal? The Green New Deal is a set of goals introduced by Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Edward J. Markey. It aims to not only tackle the issue of climate change and the environment, but also social, economic, and national ones, such as reducing economic inequality and job creation. To that end, um, the research this summer has been centered on analyzing some of the systems in Appalachia and how these systems fit into the ad agenda put forward by the Green New Deal. It is a continuation of the fall 2020 course designing a Green New Deal version two, as it narrows down some of the key um, assets and workforce considerations in the region of Appalachia. So my work over the summer was to put together and analyze the materials that will be used in the course. The materials fall into these three main categories, which I will be going through in detail in the next couple of slides. So economic development is the main narrative through which prison building is justified. 
This system incapacitates ra racialized and over-policed communities and then provides few undesirable employment opportunities to host these communities. The prison is more than just a building or the numbers of people inside that building. The system, the carceral system has become increasingly bound up in issues, in everyday issues and everyday interrelationships such as electoral politics, finance and land use. And so with this course, we hope to expand the boundaries within which we assess the criminal justice system. And in doing so, we evaluate the role of prisons today. So an example of a case study would be USP Letcher, which is the fourth federal prison built in Eastern Kentucky since 1992. The Congress committed half a billion dollars to the prison, even though the Bureau of Prisons does not think it is necessary. Next slide. So on a black sense of place, it is important to understand black histories and geographies um, to frame how we currently assess racial violence. The plantation is a meaningful historical geography that has provided a theoretical framework for thinking about the ways black life and black histories link to post-slave conceptualizations of geographical violence. Next slide. So one of my favorite quotes from the readings um, about a black sense of place is this powerful one by Bristorio, which reads that instead of trying to convince people that highly incarcerated groups are not inferior, we should also abolish institutions and relations that oppress them. So lastly, I will talk about um, abandoned mine land reclamation. Next slide. About 6.2 million acres of land and water has been ruined by abandoned coal mines. Um, and so in 1977, the SMCRA was passed by Congress in order to reclaim the damage caused by mining prior to 1977. So the funding for these projects is not adequately distributed according to need, hence proper legislation should be enacted to put in place a proper distribution mechanism. Additionally, due to the heavy dependence of coal mine jobs in Appalachia, the decline in this industry has led to unemployment in Appalachia. And so capitalizing on this desperation, um, a prison building is one of the economic alternatives that have been offered. Next slide. So in conclusion, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, efforts to restructure the society around prisons could be redirected towards other projects and vocational skills that would actually build the community. Uh, for example, drug rehabilitation centers and cancer treatment facilities. Common green jobs would also be a step in the right direction. Um, these often don't need special education and can be taught on the job, such as housekeeping, tile installation, um, and agricultural work. Um, lastly, if designed strategically, abandoned mine land reclamation projects can also provide long-term economic benefits and create local jobs in agriculture, recreation, and tourism. So I will now be taking any questions um, for the two courses. I can also take questions in the chat as I put forward my acknowledgements to Professor William Fleming and Professor Shelley Spector uh, for working with me this summer, as well as Natalie Walker, who has been a great help in navigating ISAC this summer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sydney. Both of those projects were extremely fascinating um, and what a, a variety of work you got to work on. So thank you for that. Um, next up, uh, our student will be introduced by um, Andy Hamler and Maria Antonia Andrews. Okay, thank you, Nina. Um, first off, uh, I want to thank the Sustainability Office for their support of an Isaac intern uh, this summer. Uh, there's a chance I've had more Isaac interns over the years than anyone else, but I want to say that uh, the work done by Macy Stacher uh, this summer, uh, Macy's a sophomore in political science and environmental studies. The work that he's done for Maria Andrews uh, urban air quality course and my energy education in Philadelphia schools course, I think is gonna have a real long lasting impact, not only for integrating sustainability into the curriculum of those two courses on the Penn campus, but for 
integrating sustainability into the curriculum of many, many high school science uh, classes across the university. Uh, in my class over the last two years, I've had 10 students develop uh, short lesson plans on residential energy efficiency, healthy homes and career pathways in energy. And uh, the uh, 10 students have taught those lessons to ninth graders at Robeson and West Philadelphia High School. Uh, what Macy and a, another student supported by the Netter Center for Community Partnerships did this summer was uh, come up with uh, new, refined, very interactive lesson plans. They worked with school district teachers. They got a lot of expert advice on this. And uh, what I, I've looked at them, and they're really, really good. Uh, people are very excited about these lesson plans. So going into this fall, um, I've got some great lesson plans that can be taught uh, at West Philadelphia High School. We're still determining exactly what schools this will happen at. Uh, after they're taught, in the first part of the semester, uh, the class will uh, distribute them more widely uh, through the school district via the Philadelphia Higher Education Network for Neighborhood Development, who's uh, just recently taken on sustainability as one of their major initiatives for, the, uh, for this year. And all of this meshes really, really well with a growing interest in what I would call a Green New Deal for Philadelphia schools. Akira Rodriguez in the city planning department uh, is very interested in this. And Penn is, is already uh, a part of this in a big way with its $100 million commitment to remove asbestos from uh, school basements over the next 10 years. So uh, where, where are we headed? Yeah, let's get asbestos out of the basement. Uh, there's a group that's still thinking about how carbon offsets might be created by supporting solar on school roofs in Philadelphia. So if we get the uh, asbestos out of this basement, the right technology, on school roofs and uh, the right curriculum in the classroom, um, I think we'll be on the right track. And Macy uh, has uh, put together some really good lesson plat uh, plans that build this platform to support this work going forward. So I will turn it over to Macy. Thanks for the introduction, Professor Humler. Um, before I start the presentation, I just wanted to take the, th the time to thank uh, Penn Sustainability and my Isaac program advisors, Dr. Andrew Humler and Dr. Maria Antonia Andrews for uh, this valuable opportunity this summer, as well as thank the team I worked alongside uh, with including um, ECA and Netter Center intern Alina Ho, um, ABCS coordinator from the, from the Netter Center, Anna Balfons, um, EAS 242 TA and K-12 educator Tyler Kitchenman, um, and the science department chair from Robeson High School, Lou Losey. Um, and next slide, please. So to get into um, the uh, focus courses of the Isaac program this summer, um, both ENVS 411 or air pollution sources and effects in urban environments and EAS 242 or at energy education in, in Philly schools um, are categorized as academic-based community service courses um, in which a significant portion of the semester is devoted to college to K-12 uh, student collaboration that strengthens the quality of life and learning in local Philadelphia communities um, and the quality of learning and scholarship in uh, the university for students and faculty. Um, and so with that unique uh, course uh, structure in mind, um, con contextualizing a key focus of the course development um, is, uh, you know, developing resources for, uh, you know, and researching how to best fit the needs of K-12 students in, uh, you know, the community that Penn resides in. And so the questions in the development process that we asked ourselves is, um, who are Penn students working with when entering Philly classrooms as teachers? Um, and, and how do we uh, identify the educational background in context of the student of the students these uh, courses are intended to support and how do we meet them where they are in their educational journey. And then so, oh, next slide, please. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> um, so um, with, with, that, with that in mind, um, it, meeting with administrators at Robeson High School as well as uh, uh, you know, other educators, um, it was astonishing to find out that only 17% of, uh, of 
uh, Philadelphia uh, ninth graders, students entering ninth grade, were expected to be proficient in biology or the biology uh, keystone uh, assessment. Um, and so another goal for my work plan consisted of figuring out how to create a more, more of an equitable and engaging learning experience, learning how to best do that, you know, meeting with Robeson High School students, talking about what sparks their curiosity in science and figuring out what as learners they want from their learning experience, you know, putting the students in the, in the driver's seat um, and, and how we prepare students and lesson plans for these school visits. Um, are the tools by which we strive to meet that goal. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is kind of just a general um, overview of, of the different tasks uh, we worked on over the summer, but essentially constructing uh, work plans, familiarization with course content, um, the, de the development of the lesson plans um, and lectures for both courses and a partnership with the um, Energy Coordinating Agency. Next slide, please. Um, so to get uh, a little further into the work plan, um, you know, there was a differentiated process with ENVS 411, um, having the work for the summer, having less of a focus on the ABCS uh, portion of the course, um, but rather revamping, redeveloping, rewriting um, readings, resources, discussions, and lectures assigned to the students in the ENVS 411 uh, course. Um, in, you know, in preparation for the uh, work that they'd be doing in classroom with fifth graders about anti-idling, uh, you know, car campaign um, and asthma lesson plans. Um, and for EAS 242, uh, packaging lesson plans to be used by Penn students during their visits to Robeson High School and as a resource provided on the ECA website um, for any teacher to pull from to enhance or provide their students with activity-based energy education. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, you may be guessing um, why I have a picture of my air conditioner on this slide, um, but researching concepts uh, while working as an Isaac intern applied and continue to apply to my personal life as well as inspired many of the lesson plans and lectures uh, developed for both courses. And so for the first few days of the program, I knew apartment had no air conditioning in scorching uh, New York City summer weather. And so while researching and learning more about course concepts to be better equipped to develop, to develop new content, I ended up learning about how to reduce the air exchange rate and cool and prevent cool air from exhausting my apartment um, and, you know, ways to limit the amount of indoor air hazards, especially as someone with asthma myself. Uh, next slide. And so in in that, with that in mind as well, um, you know, it may appear to be, a, you know, a surprising statistic, uh, but, you know, on average, uh, Americans spend more than 90% of their time indoors. And while a major purpose of the indoors, whether that be homework or elsewhere, is to provide safety um, and comfort from the risk of the outdoors, there are also risks to human health because of the confinement of the air volume within a given enclosed indoor environment. Risks increase because of the greater quantity of time indoors during COVID, especially in a topic that had overlap between both courses surrounded the maintenance of a healthy balance between good insulation and homes to keep energy bills down and promote, promote sustainability and retaining event, uh, enough ventilation to prevent persistent and chronic inhalation of indoor air contaminants that we expose ourselves to every day that includes of VOCs from uh, cleaning products to uh, disinfectants, air fresheners, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, you know, around the topic of sustainability, an important facet of such is the incorporation of environmental justice and how harmful and unsustainable practices have historically harmed people. Um, and this is especially vital of the discussion in a service learning course tailored towards the West Philly community that Penn resides in and whose young students are the focus of the course's engagement. And so discussion around environmental health disparities um, in which often people of color and low-income families face higher rates of illness and death than more well-off communities. Um, and with one in four, um, you know, uh, Philly uh, youth having asthma, Philly students are disproportionately impacted by unhealthy homes and health-wise health and educationally. And so this is a really important conversation to have 
um, in, in these ABCS courses to truly engage with Philly K-12 students in a manner that isn't simply contractual, but um, mutually beneficial and learned experience. Um, next slide. So these are um, just like images of the lesson plans, um, but essentially, I, I know I don't have much time left, so um, we develop activities from um, indoor home asthma audits to um, an energy efficiency activity with uh, different types of light bulbs um, to an energy flow and energy um, um, infrastructure um, activity with uh, Skittles. And um, <laughs> so a bunch of cool things that I wish that I was doing in, um, in, in, in K-12 school. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I should open uh, for questions because I don't have enough time to finish the rest. But um, these are just images of, of the activities demonstrating concepts like heat transfer, energy efficiency, uh, budgeting and construction science. These lessons plan look great. And I, yeah, I totally empathize. I wish I could have taken these courses when I was a child too. Um, they look awesome. So thank you so much for all your work. Uh, Macy, this is really exciting to see. Yes, and thank you for being conscious of time. We have a lot of great presentations to go through today. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Aline uh, Gatignon and Mirko Heinel to introduce their student. Hello. Um, Aline and I, we work together with Prof. Mangal. He uh, graduated uh, with an MBA this spring from Wharton and majored in finance. Um, Aline and I had him work on Accounting 102 and Management 101. Both of those are Wharton undergrad um, core courses that sort of introduce students to basic concepts. And so basically what we try to do is get um, students or Wharton students an early exposure to some sort of sustainability topics. Prafur, floor is yours. Um, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Marco for the introduction and thank you, Pan Sister Bridge Office uh, for giving this opportunity. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, so I, I worked on Accounting 102, which is managerial accounting. This course basically helps um, with the financial issues and making and performance evaluations uh, within firms. And for the second course is Management 101, which is the course that helps students to understand how managers can formulate and uh, implement strategies effectively within their organizations. Next slide, please. So my work plan over the summer was to read the course materials, completely understand what sort of concepts are covered within those courses, and then deep dive into literature review and understand what other concepts uh, we can come up with and incorporate within the course materials, either adding some of the concepts that are already taught in the courses or com coming up with different concepts related to sustainability that can be incorporated across the courses. Next slide. So starting with accounting 102, the first concept, concept I came up with is called impact weighted accounts, IWA. Next slide. So what are IWAs? So IWAs are the line items uh, that can be incorporated in financial statements that are not there yet, uh, specifically in income statements as well as balance sheet. So these uh, accounts are, uh, are helpful to internalize the externalities that are not captured within these statements yet. Uh, these externalities can have a positive or negative impact on employees, customers, environments, and the broader society. And like I said, they are not captured, so it would be it would be beneficial to have them on financial statements and look at the impact from those externalities. Next slide, please. So, why do we need IWAs? Like I mentioned, uh, the current the current practice in accounting in the financial statements are not uh, capturing the external externalities related related to environmental challenges, social welfare challenges, as well as uh, product challenges and the monetary impact of those uh, externalities, the impact of, of the products and services that organizations offer uh, sh should be incorporated in the financial statements and IWAs will basically help doing that. Next slide, please. So one framework that can be used to measure the impact and, uh, and estimate the monetary, uh, monetary impact on uh, from the products that organizations sell. So this framework captures uh, uh, seven, seven different elements, uh, which are quantity, duration, accessibility, quality, optionality, optionality pollutants and efficiency, as well as recyclability of the products uh, across, as you can see, four, four different segments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go deeper into, into the framework, but this framework can be applied across different industries and geographies. One of the example here you can see in the table, uh, the framework is applied on automobile companies. In the first column, you can see the different uh, seven impact dimensions from quantity, 
uh, up to recyclability. And the second column tells you how the what formulas can be used to estimate the monetary impact of each uh, impact uh, dimension and what are, what could be the different data sources uh, uh, that can help you to to understand to figure out the data required to 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 estimate the monetary impact. So again, uh, this framework is applicable across all the industries. This is just one example for automobile companies and uh, depending on what products or what industry you want to apply this framework to, the corresponding formulas and the data sources will be uh, changed accordingly. Next slide, please. So how can we use those uh, uh, results, uh, results from the product impact framework and how can we apply these in, in, the, in the existing accounting practices? So uh, the, the research that I read, which uh, from where I, I, I came up this uh, framework with. So it mentions this, uh, the monetary impact from that uh, impact framework can be incorporated in the revenue line item because revenues basically deal with the number of uh, products sold as well as the price of the product. And since uh, the monetary impact also relates to the product, so it's best to incorporate the monetary impact of, of that framework within the revenue. Uh, if it's a positive, or if the if the overall impact is positive uh, monetary wise, then the revenues will go up by the same amount. And if the product impact is negative in monetary terms, then the revenues will be decreased by the same amount. Uh, so that's how we can incorporate the framework results in the accounting uh, in, in the existing financial statements. Next slide, please. The second part of the research was looking at environmental cost accounting systems. Um, next slide. So to understand the ECA systems, first we have to understand what are the environmental costs. So as per US EPA, environmental costs are uh, are distributed across four different items, which are direct costs related to preventing pollution, uh, hidden costs uh, related to environmental regulation as well as compliance, and lastly the intangible costs uh, related to uh, risk of reduction in uh, brand equity by by stakeholders if the if the environmental costs are huge. Uh, next slide, please. So how can we in integrate ECA systems with the financial technique called activity-based costing systems, which are taught in accounting 102. So these are the seven different steps in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go deeper into that, but essentially what you do is you look at the resources that are utilized, uh, utilized to, to capture environmental cost. And then we uh, look at the resource driver rates, uh, the, the resource driver rates, and we, we figure out what are the total environmental costs and basically try to, uh, try to assign the resources consumed by each products and services that organization sells. So this is how you can uh, capture the, or integrate the ABC systems with, uh, uh, with ECA systems. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide just uh, tells you a few examples, like how, what, are, what could be the different activity centers, environmental activities, resources, as well as activity drivers that again can help to figure out the driver rates as well as the resource consumption. Uh, and how we can relate these costs uh, or assign these costs to the corresponding products and services that organization is selling. Next slide, please. Uh, so I have to go faster. So for management 101, I specifically looked at uh, Natura case analysis. So Natura is a big cosmetics company which sells 700 uh, products uh, across eight different segments. Uh, it primarily sells products through direct sales model. It, it employs uh, 1.5 million sales personnel uh, worldwide. Most of the revenues come from Brazil and it uh, recently acquired ASOP and Body Shop in 2013 and 2017 respectively. Next slide, please. So Natura had a deep uh, network across the stakeholders. You can see there are two, 297 uh, cross partnerships across 12 different sectors that Natura developed over the years. Next slide, please. Uh, in order to create the shared, uh, in order to create the shared values across the supply chain uh, that Natura was working in, it it uh, it created projects across three different segments, which are educational programs. Second is the uh, best practices or sustainable practices to source the ingredients used for used for cosmetics, and the third one is the development of commercial opportunities for suppliers. And as you can see, these are partners that were involved in creation of those shared values for the supply chain stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. So Natura, since it was working in Brazil, Brazil had a significant uh, voice in the in the institution infrastructure. So Natura came up with this open institutional infra infrastructure, which was not only open for its own purposes of business and not only for the supply chain partners, but also it was open to the society at large and even for its competitors. Uh, next slide, please. The impact of this uh, infrastructure was that uh, the 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 the, the 
default rates for the loans uh, for sales consultants was extremely low at 1.5%. Uh, the turnover rates of the consultants were extremely low at 15% as compared to 20-25% in the industry or as compared to 35% of its competitors. Uh, next slide. As well as there were uh, other impacts, for example, it was able to conserve 257,000 hectares of forest by again using this infrastructure it created to help uh, stakeholders in the, in the supply chain. Next slide, that's it. Open for any questions. Wow, that was a lot of great content you, you got in there. Thank you so much for, for being so quick. That was, and covering quite a bit of material. So, um, and again, we are kind of running out of time. So we'll save questions for the end, hopefully. Um, but thank you so much for your time and effort. So that was the last of the integrating sustainability across the curriculum uh, students. And now we're gonna be turning it over to the civic sustainability fellows. And you might hear my poodle barking in the background, I apologize. Um, so uh, the uh, first um, uh, civic sustainability fellow will be uh, presented by their sponsor, um, Helena Rudolph from the city of, the Office of Sustainability for the city of Philadelphia. Hi everyone, um, I'm uh, excited to introduce Jocelyn. I will only be very brief, but um, it's exciting to uh, uh, be able to see this presentation and all the amazing projects Jocelyn's done over the summer. I think in total you hear about four different projects. So she really accomplished a lot of work this summer and it was really exciting to work with her. Um, I was previously a civic sustainability fellow myself. And so uh, it's really fun to, you know, go full circle and, uh, I'll, I'll definitely miss Jocelyn when she leaves us next week. So I'll hand it over to her. Hi, thank you for that um, really nice introduction. So um, hi everyone, my name is Jocelyn. I'm a rising junior studying chemical engineering. Um, and this summer I worked with the Office of Sustainability as a Civic Sustainability Fellow. Um, and so there's four main parts of the work that I kind of worked on and kind of the work um, with the city. So. Um, the first one is mitigation, the second is resilience, the third is energy, and then the last is outreach. Um, so if you click the next button, um, I first worked on mitigation, and so that kind of encompassed the citywide waste diversion calculation rate, commercial food waste education, and also a zero waste design again. Next slide, please. So um, for the citywide waste diversion calculation rate, this is a rate that is calculated every single year um, to show the city how much waste has been diverted from landfills. So this could be from recyclers, secondhand stores, et cetera. And so some of the things that I've done is to update a database full of these recyclers, contact them so that they can provide the amount of waste diverted. Um, and this is in the form of either recycling, composting, um, even just like repurposing, and then tabulating and performing some data analysis to see um, how this trend and this rate has changed throughout the years. Next slide, please. So this affects Penn because these numbers can help guide Penn to implement more diversion practices. And Penn also has um, some hand in, in this number as they use some of the recyclers um, that we contact. Next slide, please. So some of the key findings that we found were that 34% of waste um, is, material, is metals, and that's diverted. And then 11% of waste that is diverted are organic materials. And so I highlight these two specific um, categories because I feel like this is the most pertinent to things that Penn deals with. And then lastly, we found that 9.8% of all Philadelphia waste is diverted from landfills. And um, even though this number seems low, not to scare everyone, but this is um, just preliminary data because um, a lot of the diverted waste from landfills is actually C and D um, waste. So that's what we're waiting on to get a final number. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, so the next part of my work was with the commercial was was with commercial food waste. So I created education materials surrounding this, including a two-page and a palm card. So on the right-hand side, you'll see um, the fully designed palm card. And so this kind of talks about the dumpster ordinance and the food waste alternatives that commercial property owners can use to um, handle their grindable food waste. And so um, not many people know, but it's actually illegal to put grindable food waste in dumpsters. And so this is something that we wanted to um, further advertise to people and make it make people more knowledgeable about that. 
And further than that, we also wanted to offer a lot of alternatives to food waste disposal, such as reduction, donation, and composting. And so the last part of my work within this was to identify some key metrics um, so that we can help uh, measure the progress of the materials um, by working with the streets department to uh, give out these materials and then also make sure that people are complying with the city ordinance. Next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to highlight how this affects Penn. And so there, um, Penn is also considered a commercial food waste, pro uh, a commercial food property. Um, owner and with a lot of the dining halls and food establishments. So um, these kind of alternatives can also be uh, implemented on Penn's campus. And lastly, I would just like to highlight that this information is publicly available now um, on a blog post within the Office of Sustainability and then also down, and then the PDFs are downloadable for anyone to view. Next slide, please. Um, and so lastly, within the realm of mitigation, I've been working on the Zero Waste Designer Guide, which is a 20-page guide for Philadelphia designers to implement, to implement zero waste practices. So this includes things such as pattern cutting in the pre-consumer phase, and then also um, different uh, ways to create a circular design process um, in the post-consumer phase with take-back programs, et cetera. And so to do this, I did a lot of research on the best practices and also interviewed a lot of local Philly designers who implement these sustainable practices um, within their business. And so we hope that this guide will be a great tool for anyone who's interested into getting into the fashion design space um, and will be available for the public as well. And just to highlight how this would impact Penn, um, I would consider implementing a course in sustainable design within possibly the design school, um, specifically within textiles. And I think that this would be a great resource. And then also just allowing this information to um, be shared with aspiring artists and designers at Penn. So secondly, I wanna talk about my work with resilience um, within the Office of Sustainability. And so this looks in the um, realm of a food activity for the Hunting Park Summer Camp and then also support on the food and climate resilience within the office. Next slide, please. And so um, the main activity within this um, resilience part is this food activity. And so I created a relay race activity for kids at, a summer, at the Hunting Park Summer Camp to learn more about food waste. Um, and so on the right-hand side, you'll just see a little um, screenshot of what one of the parts of the activity looked like. And so by the end, students, kids got the chance to kind of take home this um, handout so that they can bring in, you know, put a magnet on the refrigerator with. And so this can help influence the kids to reduce their food waste and then also learn about the other ways that you can handle food waste. And so another way that this impacts Penn is um, a similar checklist could be provided for students in dorms, off campus, and dining halls to also reduce their own food waste and hopefully um, students would hang this up in their refrigerator similarly. Next slide, please. And then the third part of um, my work with Office of Sustainability is um, within the Energy Office. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So I created, um, I helped create a user interface for the Energy PDF tool that lives within the Energy Office. Um, and so this PDF tool helps aggregate a lot of the um, data that's um, from all the different energy suppliers that we work with. And for and there's a lot of this because it happens monthly and also for all the um, city buildings. And so my work was to use Python and PYQT5 to create a user interface um, that's easily accessible and usable for um, city employees to make, so that, to make sure that um, this is like very user friendly. Next slide, please. And then lastly, I worked on outreach via social media and communication projects. So some of this work um, included, oh, next slide. Some of this work included designing social media posts for Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for the OOS initiatives and information for residents. So some of this was taking um, the information that I had put in guides and two pagers, and then also displaying it in information accessible for social media posts. Um, but also this includes other information that other parts of the office are working on as well. 
Um, and overall, that's all that I worked on this summer. And before I end, I would just like to give a big thank you to Penn Sustainability for their support this summer and also the Office of Sustainability, their amazing staff, and especially my, Hel my manager, Helena, um, for all of her guidance and support this summer. Um, thank you, and I will take questions at the end. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. It's great to see um, both the, you know, Helena going full circle on Civic Sustainability Fellows and then the great work that you've done with the city and how you've tied it back to Penn. I think that's a great example. And we're very lucky to be a zero waste partner institution with the city. And I hope to continue that great relationship so we can address waste in our area together. So um, moving on, uh, we will be working uh, uh, we'll be hearing from the sponsor um, of Angela's, who's Madish Ila from the Philadelphia Energy Authority. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm Avish Elias, the program manager with the Philadelphia Energy Authority. Um, and this summer, we hosted Angela Sun as a Seoul Rice Valley intern, and it was an absolute pleasure working with her. So a huge thanks to Penn Sustainability for facilitating um, Angela's placement with our office. Um, Angela was a great addition to our team with her positive attitude and ability to proactively engage with our partners. Um, so she supported the launch of phase five of Seoul Rice Philly, which is the single largest Seoul Rice initiative in the whole country. Um, Angela, you know, engaged with solar installers, um, council offices, utilities, and most importantly, with Philly property owners who want to go solar. Um, she also supported a series of events and webinars to engage uh, and, you know, generally educate the community on the benefits of going solar. And last but not the least, she also helped manage one of our training programs. So I will let Angela talk more about the phenomenal work she did this summer. Um, Angela, take it away. Hello, I'm Angela. Um, as you may know, I entered the Solarize Philly this summer um, under the manager, um, Mavis Ilias. Thank you so much for introducing me. Um, so I kind of wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about my experience in the program um, and first introduce the program. So I can, you can go to the next slide. Yes. So. Um, the Philadelphia Energy Authority, um, which houses um, Solarize Philly, is a municipal government agency established in 2010 um, with the mission of economic development, combating climate change and improving public health through clean energy and energy efficiency initiatives. Um, among its many programs is Solarize Philly, which is Philadelphia's main solar energy program. Um, and we can go to the next slide. And maybe the next slide after that. Thank you so much. Okay, so Solaris Philly was founded in 2017 um, and Solaris is currently in its fifth phase of operations. Um, one great thing about uh, the program is that it is the largest program in the United States of its kind um, with over 6,500 signups in phase four alone, um, as well as 750 um, Philadelphians already having signed a contract to go solar um, with most, most of these projects being installed um, to date, um, as well as over 12 million invested into the Philadelphia economy. Um, so I was an intern in the program um, under Mavis Elias, who is here today. Um, and next I'll take a little bit of time to talk about the internship itself. So yes, thank you so much. Um, so my internship lasted from uh, May 2021 to August 2021. During this time, I mainly assisted with the launch of the new phase of Solarize Philly, um, which actually began earlier this August, which is really exciting. Um, and this new phase expanded on previous phases by growing to incorporate new financing options, um, including a lease option, as well as a new commercial solar option and finance structure um, for this for the first time. Um, so some of the tasks that or activities um, I was involved in in this um, in this phase was organizing materials for our installer RFP. Um, so that's the request for proposal and pre-approving our um, contractors for the uh, contractors for the new phase, as well as customer calls and um, getting people signed up for the new phase. Um, and lastly, or not lastly, but also supporting the Solar Week webinar series during our um, Solar Week, which occurred earlier um, this August from the 16th to the 20th. Um, 
And during that time, I also helped set up um, the pre uh, press conference to announce the launch of the program um, in which I was able to kind of meet and interact with uh, many, many members of the city council and also the Office of Sustainability, which was wonderful. Um, and in um, supporting the program as well, I um, conducted research for data management. So really um, finding ways to work closely with our installers and manage data in a way that is effective between parties. Um, and uh, when needed, I was also called out to help on the PEA, Philadelphia Energy Authority's uh, Workforce Development Program, GRIT, which actively promotes green career opportunities to Philadelphia youth. Um, in GRIT, I was primarily involved in outreaching to potential employers of graduated trainees. Um, this year, we had a total of seven um, graduated trainees, and we so far have managed to match six out of the seven trainees, um, which is um, a great deal of progress, and that's it's very, very exciting. Um, and uh, in that task, I was able to um, outreach to employers, add contacts, and also schedule meetings um, to meet with, with, um, with these employers. Um, and then we can go to the next slide. And so during um, or through all these projects, one main thing that I really appreciated was being able to connect with people of all backgrounds and, and um, diverse communities. Um, these included community members and homeowners who wanted to go solar, um, <clears throat> solar companies, local small businesses, and also artists and activists that wanted to highlight solar in our community through their art, um, utilities, third party providers, um, as well as Philadelphia council members and members of, of the Office of Sustainability. Um, and the I truly appreciate being able to see how vibrant and active the solar community is, um, even through the pandemic, um, the enthusiasm there was, was inspiring. So, and then we can go to the next slide. So a few um, internship takeaways um, can be broadly categorized into number one, um, most of all learning about sort of what concerns and priorities existed in the community, not only revolving around solar, but also um, more generally. So <clears throat> it had come to my attention that while many Philadelphians are motivated by um, a social goal to combat climate change. Um, a lot of community members also see solar as an economic opportunity. And this is especially important given that Philly um, bears one of the highest energy burdens out of all, all of the cities in the US, which means that um, Philadelphians are spending a greater proportion of their income on their electricity bill than, um, than the norm. So it's a matter of advancing people's livelihoods um, and through the calls and through um, interacting um, with people in the community, it raises important questions about not only what solar is trying to advance, but how we're advancing it and who we're advancing it for. Um, and using solar as an opportunity to, um, for, for energy equity and economic equity, um, hand in hand. So the second thing that I was really able to sense and gain from this experience um, in the Philadelphia Energy Authority is um, a feeling of genuine momentum for solar and also for the power of financing, um, the power of the financing has granted solar. Um, and the fact that the in infrastructure has been built um, both at the federal level, the state level and the municipal level. Um, and there is um, there are many, many uh, opportunities to take advantage. Um, and it was also a privilege to get to interact with um, diverse people whose careers revolve around and were built by solar um, um, as part of this internship. So um, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, now focusing more inward towards um, the campus and how, um, how the things that I've learned can apply here. So um, a, lot of, a lot of what solar can do can be done at the larger scale. And this is something that both is both within, the Penn, within Penn's interest and also something that Penn is currently actively recognizing. So um, actually last year, Penn was able to sign a um, record PPA for 
our power purchase agreement for two solar generation facilities constituting about 75% of Penn's electricity consumption, which is in no doubt um, a step in the right direction and a sign that Penn is recognizing the opportunity um, to invest in a green electricity portfolio um, backed by solar as one of the easiest routes to uh, reaching its net neutrality targets. Um, but that is uh, that being said, there is still much to be done, um, both at the larger scale and at the smaller scale. Um, we can go to the next slide. Yes. So at the level where, uh, where smaller, um, uh, smaller actors can be actionable. Um, there is definitely a lot more to do um, in terms of lobbying the university for even greener and greener investment choices. Um, Penn's portfolio is both large as it is very, um, very influential. Um, and so um, even as students, um, we can advocate for uh, more greater investment in renewables, not only just for campus, but um, on a larger scale. Um, and greater investment in energy technology. Um, and the second is perhaps smaller, but even um, uh, no less important. So the second is educating the community about the robustness of solar. Um, and the sense of, sense of momentum that I, that I mentioned uh, beforehand um, really comes into play here. Um, often students and also uh, members of the community, um, they, um, um, a lot of the effects of solar are not quite as visible, um, and yet it makes such a great economic influence in our community. Um, so um, granting people the sense that this is a great opportunity to um, great opportunity to further for their solar um, for both the individual and and at large is very important. Um, and then last slide is just acknowledgements. Um, oh, yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, acknowledgements, I want to acknowledge my um, project manager, Mavish Ilias, for providing me this wonderful opportunity. Um, and I will take any questions. Wonderful, Angela. I love the uh, solar work. Solar Ice Philly has been doing so much amazing work and it's great to see, you know, the impact solar can have both locally and beyond. Um, it's just an exciting project. Um, so in the interest of time, we're gonna keep moving through and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end as well. So think of your questions. Um, so thank you again, Angela. And I'm happy to introduce this, uh, the sponsor for our next student, uh, Keisha Hulling with UC Green. Uh, is Keisha here? I get the feeling that she is in another meeting because she's always multitasking, so I'll just go. <laughs> awesome, go for it, Shelby. <laughs> okay, next slide. Oh, there's a typo, that's so sad. Okay, so I worked with UC Green over the summer. UC Green is a small nonprofit organization, and our goal was basically to increase tree canopy coverage throughout West and Southwest Philadelphia, as well as increase green space because it's associated with better mental and physical health. Also in the city, if you have adequate tree canopy, you have the ability to decrease temperatures in the summer by up to 10 degrees. And when that's the difference between a 90 degree day and a 100 degree day or 80 and 90, that means a lot to citizens. UC Green is also affiliated with PHS, which is the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. They are just a big group of tree people and gardeners and <laughs> arborists and horticulturists that love nature. And together with their help, UC Green has planted over 5,000 trees since its founding. Next slide, please. Okay, so one of the gardens that I got to visit because this internship was very hands-on, like boots on the ground, that's a phrase I was looking for, with helping people and growing things in the garden and basic community outreach. So Holly Street Garden is a garden that UC Green tends for, and it produces about 
4,500 pounds of produce every season. If you look to the left, you can see the garden producing fruit as usual. So the garden serves approximately 24,000 citizens, and over the summer, a lot of citizens rely on the garden for fresh fruits and vegetables. To the left also is Winnie Harris. She used to be a head executive of UC Green before she sadly passed away, but she's the one who founded Polish Street Garden. Next slide, please. So this is a picture of one of our halls from the Holly Street Garden, that's me on the left, holding a marrow, which is a cordette, which is basically a really big cucumber. <laughs> to the left, you can see that marrow that I was holding and another one under it, and lots of white cucumbers, peppers, other pickled cucumbers, leafy greens. Next slide, please. And the thing about Holly Street Garden is that all of the gardens that UC Green tends to has to directly help citizens. So after the haul, after I learned how to pick ripe fruits and vegetables, which is surprisingly harder than most people think. Most people think you should just wear short sleeves, but no, you want long sleeves to be covered up so the mosquitoes don't bite you. I did learn that the hard way, but we dropped it off at the community fridge and hall and I got to meet lots of other community members who were also dropping stuff off from their own like small like home gardens that they were growing or from other gardens that they helped tend. Next slide please. I also was in charge of leading and recruiting for pruning club events. Pruning club is a it's an activity basically sponsored by PHS, the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, where we get people interested in planting and learning about trees and nature, all community volunteers to help keep the trees healthy by pruning and de-weeding them and talking to homeowners or apartment owners about how they can keep their trees healthy. So to the right, we see pictures of are lovely volunteers. Some of them are trained arborists and some of them are just people who decided I have free time. Why can't we help? So yeah, next slide please. Also as part of being associated with PHS, we, we as in UC Green, deals with a lot of tree tending, which is basically just tree care. To the right you see a picture of the tree database, like a huge log of all the trees that UC Green has planted. So there are like 5,000 plus trees, and then there's several other organizations all with their trees logged into the database, and we keep track of the health condition, the homeowner status of the trees, just to make sure that we can keep them healthy. And as a first year who had no idea that any of this existed, I was shocked and amazed that so much care goes into trees. You just see a tree on the street and you're like, is this a tree? It was there. It wasn't there. Now it's there. It's living its life. But no, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Next, please. All right. So when I talk about on the ground work, a lot of what I did was community outreach. So talking to people on the ground about getting more trees planted and talking to their neighbors to get more trees planted or add planters with flowers in them. But I also learned that although we can talk to community members about planting trees, we also have to expand their knowledge on how to maintain and keep a tree healthy. So this is a tree that a community member had unfortunately not killed, but probably not taken care of the best. You can see that the root flare, which is the very bottom of the tree, was deeply buried and that, that should have been above ground. So all the gardening tool you see stuck in a hole that I dug, all of that should have been above ground. So I was like, oh wow, yeah, people, they know that trees are hardy, but most people just need a baseline of how to take care of trees. So that was the first time I uprooted a tree. That was a very fun experience. Next slide, please. Okay, a little bit about the root flares. So a root flare is basically like the main root system of a tree and it's kind of like, it's lungs. So when you bury it under mulch or trash or whatnot, 
you're basically choking the tree, which kills the tree. And it was an interesting concept to learn, one, because I didn't know it, two, that most people don't know it. So a lot of what I did was creating infographics and sending out emails and creating pamphlets and handing it out to people and setting up informational meetings to just teach community members. This is how you take care of a tree. I promise you it's not difficult, but if you just do these small steps, you too can have a healthy tree one day. That was a lot of my spokesperson. I'm the tree person in general for the year. Let's plant you a tree that I had going on. Next slide, please. I also met the Tree Tenders Network, which is very expensive. We have UC Green, PHS, other tree tending groups, the people at the Woodland Cemetery. And it's very, it was very fun to meet all of these people because they all have a great energy because they spend all their time around plants. And when I met them, they were having an impromptu ice cream party. And because one of them had an ice cream truck and so many people need to understand that you can be a tree person and a plant person and have other hobbies. You don't just have to be supernatural. So yeah, someone, one of their day jobs is just selling ice cream to people. And that's my lemon basil pop on the side. It's vegan. I was very happy about that because I'm vegan. That was at the Woodlands. And the there are also pictures of other small pop-up gardens that people in the tree network like allow people the tree network grow and give the public access to because that's their whole goal is to promote green space in Philadelphia and create community networks to increase green space. Next slide, please. A lot of what I did was also grant writing. So I wrote a, a application for a Fair Life grant and we won. Fair Life is a milk brand. And they were just giving out community grants, not giving out, but we applied, I wrote it. It was the first time I wrote a grant and it was a very interesting process of writing and rewriting and reading research papers and adequately integrating information and rewriting. And apparently I did a fairly okay job at it because we won the grant. And then recently I was working on the Philadelphia Anti-Violence Community Attention Grant for a larger program which would be Green Ambassadors, which is targeting people 18 to 24 in high crime areas like Simpson Street, because increasing tree canopy significantly reduces crime rates, like a 10% increase in tree canopy is correlated with a 12% decrease in crime and a 1% increase to green space in an area is correlated with a 4% decrease in anxiety and other mood disorders. So we wanted to create a program that took high risk people and introduced them to green therapy and becoming not tree certified, but let's say tree tenders certified, like having an ISA Arbor certification means that people trust you to do tree things and <laughs> nature things. Next slide, please. Okay, pens impact that this could have on Penn and how Penn students could help. So there are countless gardens I learned in Philadelphia that are in need of volunteers and there are several Penn groups that are already somewhat environmental nature focused that could definitely be tapped into for manpower like the Penn Vegan Society or the Penn Environmental Group and I think these would be group, good groups to target as well as other groups would be good to target because a lot of Penn students are aware that the green space in Penn is an outlier because they like to explore on foot. And as you get farther out from Penn, you go west or southwest, you start to realize that it's incredibly unfair that Penn has all of these resources. So they're able to afford all this pretty green space, but native Philadelphians who have been here for how many 10 plus, 20 plus years live in green deserts where it's just concrete and that's bad for their physical, mental, emotional health. So UC Green is also working to establish a presence on Penn campus with the School of Social Policy and Practice and also become a work-study opportunity to employ more students and get more helpers to increase green space. I was also told recently that 
we may be working with the Netter Center. So I think there will be a strong UC Green presence on campus this coming semester. And that's all. Thanks for your time. Wonderful, Shelby. What a great note to end on. I think it's such a good example of how the work that y'all have done this summer will have long-term impacts in the Penn community and beyond. Um, so feel good about the work that you've accomplished, knowing that you're going to make a big impact, and hopefully you've learned things that will influence your, your future career and where you head. So uh, I know I've learned a lot from each of you, and um, I want to thank you all for your time and attention and commitment and dedication to um, the Civic Sustainability Fellows Program, as well as integrating sustainability across the curriculum. We have a few minutes left if there are any uh, questions or comments you'd like to share uh, with the group. If not, that's okay too. We're always happy to end a little early, so. Okay, well, I don't see any questions. So thank you again for your time. Um, it's just incredible, again, the work that y'all have completed this summer. Uh, I hope to see this great work continue in the future. And um, the impact of your work is going to be felt for many years to come. So again, thank you all so much. It's been wonderful.